Hello everyone, this is Experiment Design in Computer Sciences Week 4 Comparison Test Part 2 Pair Testing. Let's get straight into it. So, in the last video, we studied how to apply the statistical inference method using hypothesis testing when we want to compare two samples, let's say method A and method B. And we saw that we can do that using the same t-test that we used in the first week. Now, in this video, I'm going to show you a special situation that is very common, but it can change your results very much, so you need to be careful about it. Okay? So, the idea is pair design. So, pair design happens when you have an experiment where observations are linked in uh, sample 1 and sample 2, and they have strong dependencies. One example that I like a lot is football shoes. Let's say that you want to try two football shoes. Okay, There is an old one that, you always, that your team always used, and there's a new one that you think that the new one will, have, um, will, will take more time to wear out. So what do you do? You buy shoes for the, your entire team of brand one and brand two, and you give the shoes for your team to play for one game on brand one, and then you give the shoes for your team to play for another game in brand two, and you measure the shoes to see how much they uh, how much they wore out. Okay, now um, what happens? The problem is that. If you just measure the difference of the wearing out, you're gonna see that maybe the shoes that were wore, that maybe the shoes that the goalkeeper was using, they did not wear out a lot because the goalkeeper does not move a lot. But the shoes that the attackers were move, using, they will wear out a lot because they're running a lot. The shoes that the midfielders are using, they will gonna be the wore out most of all because they're running all the time during the match. Okay, so there's a difference about how much each shoe wear out that is just not because of the difference of the brand, but it's also the difference between who is using that shoe. So that's one example of observations that are paired. Let's give a second experiment, a second example. Imagine that you want to compare the gasoline of a car. So you have a common gasoline and you have like a special gasoline that is more efficient than common one. Okay, so to do that, you get several cars and you test uh, the gasoline on the cars. And the way that you test is that you fill the tank of a car with gasoline and you drive that car until the tank is empty. And then you measure how many kilometers that car drove. Now, if the gasoline is more efficient, the car will drive more farther away. However, Different types of cars have different gasoline usages, right? They have different efficiencies of the motors. So if it's a very big car, then it uses gasoline very fast. If it's a very small car, maybe it's economical and does not use gasoline so fast. So the difference in the amount of, of that the car drove is not only because of the type of the gasoline, it's also because of the type of the car. The second example is actually very interesting because maybe you can think, well, why don't we just use 10 cars of the same type? And you could use that if that was the goal of your experiment. Let's say that you are a taxi company, then all your taxis are the same kind of car and that's okay. You use the same kind of car and you don't have to worry about pair experiments anymore. But let's say that you are the company that is producing the few in that case, you are interested in how your fuel behave in different types of cars. So you want to use this heterogeneous experiment. You want to use your experiment different kind of cars. So you need to do the pairing. Now let's think about an example that is very common for computer science, uh, the comparison of two methods. Here I'm going to talk about two optimization methods, but I'm pretty sure that you can think of other situations that are similar. So let's say that a researcher develops a new optimization algorithm, A, ANT algorithm, 
and they want to compare this convergence against a method that represents the start of the the state of the art method B, the Bayesian algorithm. Okay, so. The researcher believes that the proposed algorithm has a theoretical advantage on a specific family of optimization problems. And this is very important. This is not really related to the topic, but this is very, very important for experiments. Before you do an experiment, try to think what is the theoretical reasoning for that experiment to give some result. Don't just, oh, here's a new method, I'm going to do an experiment. First, think about what's the theoretical reason that your method would show a different result. Anyway, uh, the researcher got a specific family of optimization problems and compared the two methods. Uh, they se she selects a benchmark of problems from that family. Now, both methods, method A and method B, are executed on the problems of the benchmark, problem one, problem two, problem three, problem four. And she measures the time that the algorithm took to converge on each problem. The, me the measurements are made under similar conditions. So it's the same computer with the same operate conditions, etc., etc. Now, in this example, we are taking several problem instances and we are running each of the two algorithms in all of the instances. The instances are different, so there will be uh, a variation in running time. Okay. Also, as we said before, just when you run a program in a computer, there will be a variation in the running time as well. So to reduce this variation on the running time, every time, for instance, when you will run algorithm A on problem one, we want to run algorithm A on problem one a few times, let's say five times or 10 times, to get the average time of algorithm A on problem one. And then we get the average time of algorithm A on problem two. And then we get the average time of algorithm A on problem three, and so on and so forth. Okay? Now, just like in the last video, think about the following questions and pause the video. We're going to answer these questions, but pause the video to check your answers before we continue. So question number one, what is the estimator that we are going to use to measure in this experiment? What are we measuring here to compare algorithm A and algorithm B on all of these problems? Okay. Now, what is one observation? Notice that we are running one method in one, one, one algorithm in one problem many times. Is one observation one of these times that we are running the method of the algorithm or is it something else? Okay. What is the sample size? If we run, let's say, two algorithms on 10 problems and for each problem we run the algorithms five times, what is the sample size here? Think a little about this, the difference between running the algorithm once on one problem and the average performance of one algorithm in one problem, and then think about the answer to these questions. Okay, let's continue. Okay, so why is pairing necessary? Okay, so when we consider observations with strong dependencies, for instance, for example, players or car types or benchmark problems, the difference between the observations is a strong source of variation. So as we talked before, when we do experiments, there are many sources of variation. There is random variation, there is variation because of the different methods that we are using. And in this case, there is also variation because of the different players, the different car types, the different benchmark problems. This variation of players, car types or problems, they are not related to the question that we are asking. What is the difference between method A and method B? So we need to control this variance so this variance does not affect our results. There is one solution for that that is very elegant, very simple, which is to pair the measurements. So what does it do? It, it needs two steps. Step one, we consider the observations in pairs, A, B, for each problem. Okay, so we have one pair, A on problem one, B on problem one. Then the second pair, A on problem two, B on problem two. Then we have the third pair, A on problem B, A on problem three, B on problem three, etc. Okay? When we have these pairs, the hypothesis testing is done on the difference of the pairs. Remember that in last video, 
The difference was the difference on the average. We got the average of sample 1 and the average of sample 2, and we calculated the difference of these averages. Here, we're calculating the difference of the pairs. It may, it may seem that these two are the same thing, but they are very different. Okay? So let's look at the statistical model first. So let's say that YAJ and YBJ, they are the pair observations of the average time for methods A and B for a specific problem J. So the pair difference, okay, the difference of a pair will be DJ, which is YIJ minus YBJ. If we go back to the idea of an addition model, the addition model is yij is mu plus tau i plus bj plus epsilon ij. Now, this mu is the general mean. It's the mean if we ignore all the possible, is the mean of the entire experiment if we ignore all the possible variations. This tau i is the variation that is caused by the differencing method. This beta j is the variation that is caused by the difference in algorithm, in problem. And this epsilon is all the other sources of variation that we cannot control, such as variation in the computer, variation in random numbers, etc. Okay? So, uh, what we do is that dj, as we said before, is yaj minus ybj, so this. And when we calculate this, yij, we substitute on this equation is mu plus t tau a plus bj plus epsilon aj minus mu tau b bj epsilon bg. We can cut mu and mu here, and we cut beta and beta here, and we're going to have tau a minus tau b, uh, and this will be the mean of the difference. This will be mu t. So when we subtract, what, when we pair the observations, what we're doing is that we are canceling the error of the problem, because the error of the problem will be the same for both, and we are cancelling the grand mean, so we just consider now, by doing this pairing, we just consider the mean of the differences. In this case, because we are working with the mean of the pair differences, our new hypothesis now is exactly the same as we did on the last video. The new hypothesis is that the means of the differences is zero, the alternate hypothesis is that the mean of the difference is not zero. So now we're back to our simple hypothesis test, and everything from now on is exactly the same as the last video. So our t statistic is this difference, this estimated difference, divided by the error of the estimated difference. So we consider the difference of pairs as one sample, and we calculate the error of that sample, divided by the number of pairs. Okay. So, what this means is that for this experiment, our sample is the pair of, 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 observ of the pair of observations in a problem. Okay, so each observation, so each pair of problems, is one observation. Note here that we are completely ignoring the repetitions. The goal of doing individual repetitions on a problem, like running five times problem one. On, uh, on algorithm A and running five times problem two on algorithm A and running five times problem three on algorithm A. These five times, the only objective for that is to reduce the randomness of the computer and the random numbers, etc. But we ignore them during the statistical test. We just consider the average time of method A problem one, average time of method A problem two, average time of method B problem one, average time of method B problem 2. And one observation for this test is the difference of the average time of method A for problem 1 and the average time of method B for problem 1. That is one observation for the pair test. Some other considerations, okay, you also things to remember. In this, in this example, the minimal interesting effect size delta is expressed in terms of average time gains across problem. Not for individual problems, but for all problems, because we are doing a comparison among, among many different problems. Because of this, it's usually better to exp express the minimum difference in 
relative terms, not in absolute terms. In the case of the steel rods, the effect is still factory. Well, because we have one target size, we can have one target difference. But because of our algorithms have very different running times, instead of saying, oh, I want a difference of five seconds, it's better to say something like, oh, I want a minimum difference of running time of 5% or 10%. Because what is 5% for problem one may be very different of what is 5% for problem five or for problem 10. Okay, so the sample size to consider in this situation is the number of problems. So for comparison of different problems, it's important to consider the number of problems. Okay, not the number of repetitions. If you increase the number of repetitions, you're not making your test stronger. If you increase the number of problems, you're making your test stronger. The number of repetitions will have an impact, of course because it's the, uh, it reduces the noise associated with the running environment, but not with the difference of the methods itself. A few extra observations. So to summarize, the pair design will remove effects of controllable nuisance factors. So for instance, the error of the computer is not controllable. It's very hard to control the error from the random numbers. But the error of the tests, you, you, you choose the benchmark test, it's controllable. So you can remove it using pair testing. So it's strongly indicated to use pair testing with uh, problems where you have strong correlation between samples. Now let's look at some numbers to make it more concrete. So let's go back to our comparing to, to our example of comparing two algorithms. Okay? So Let's say that we choose a benchmark set, set with seven problems. So we have two algorithms and seven problems, okay? Now the researcher wants to find the differences in the mean time to converge that are greater than 10 seconds, okay, then this time we're using 10 seconds, with a power of at least one minus beta, so 0 0.8, and a significance level of 0 0.05, so 95 confidence, the confidence level. Now, uh, we use 30 repeated runs for each pair of algorithm and problem, okay? This is just, uh, there's no particular reason for this number. You could do like a pretest to see how many you need, but um, sometimes you have a reviewer that loves the number 30 for reasons that we will explain in the future. Anyway, so let's see what the data is. So we get this data. We did a, a simulation of two algorithms running on different problems. And you can see here that we have problem one, problem two, problem three, problem four, problem five, algorithm A, algorithm B, algorithm A, algorithm B. Now pay attention to this table. You can see here that in all pairs, algorithm A always runs faster than algorithm B. The time for algorithm A is always smaller than the time for algorithm B. However, the time of the problem is even bigger the difference. So for instance, for problem one, we have 30 and 50 seconds. For problem seven, we have 300 seconds. So the difference of time between problems is much bigger than the difference of time between algorithms. Okay, you can see this in this graphic. So these two, the first dot is the problem A, the second dot, the first dot is method A, the second dot is method B. And each level here is a different problem, okay? So, how do we do the paired analysis? To do the paired analysis, again, we just need to set up the correct configuration of the t-test. And this is something that I recommend to you. If you don't use R, if you use some other tool like Excel or Python or anything else to calculate your statistical tests, read the manual, learn what are the options to do pair test, to do test with known variance, to do test with unknown variance. As we're gonna see here in a few seconds, the difference between a paired test and a non-paired test is very big. I had a student that was submitting a paper, uh, the, the results were extremely bad, and the results were bad because the student forgot to set the correct option for paired testing in the statistical analysis, okay? So pay attention to these differences. Anyway, when we do the paired test, we see that the t variable is minus nine, 
So that gives us a p-value of 0.05. So we see that it's a very significant difference. We got a degree field of six because we have seven tests, okay? And the average, uh, the, the, conf the confidence interval for the true, true difference between the methods is between minus 20 seconds and minus 12 seconds. So this is even lower than our requested of 10 values. So we want the 10 seconds of difference and the difference between our methods is between minus 20 and minus 12. On average, the difference was minus 17. Another way to calculate this, remember that the pair test is a one sample test on the difference of this, the observations, of the pair observations. So what we can do is that we can calculate a single array. There is um, the time, the observations of the first method and the observations of the second method. So this array, we'll have the paired observations. And if we do a single, a single, a single sample t test on this array, we're gonna get exactly the same result. Why? Think a little bit about why the result of this is exactly the same of this, okay? This will test your knowledge about if you really understand how we are doing the paired testing. Okay, let's move on. Of course, um, after you finish the testing, you need to check the assumptions. In the case of the paired testing, the, the main assumptions are the assumption for normality and the assumption of independence. As we said before, there's no real test for the assumption of independence, so we're gonna just do the assumption of normality here. So here we do a QQ plot, and we can see here that most of our observations follow a normal distribution, but we have one here that is very, very different. This one is an outlier. So what do we do? This is why we need to do these assumptions. Here, just because we have one outlier, it doesn't mean the test is invalid. Because if we remove the outlier, we're going to see that all the tests, all the other observations, they follow the normal curve. So what we do in this case is that we take this outlier and we look at what's going on. This is one problem that I see students do all the time when they do experiments. They run an experiment on 30 benchmarks, 40 data tests, 1,000 images. They just look at the aggregate data. And of course, the aggregate data will give your final result. But when you're doing the experiment, you need to see, oh, there is an outlier. Let's see what this outlier is. Because that will show you some very, very interesting things. Maybe your outlier is a special condition that you did not think before. Maybe your outlier is a bug on your code that is adding data that should not be in your experiment. And by checking your outlier, you can find some bugs in your code that you were not realized. So do this analysis of conditions, check your outliers, okay? I had uh, another student of my laboratory, they were doing an experiment that it performed very well in the first 30 observations and the last 10 observations, they had like a time, they, 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 had, they were outliers. And just looking at the, the overall results, they were kind of okay, but not very good. But when we look at the outlier, we found out why our method was performing worse at them. And then we could improve the method to include the problems that were happening, the outliers. So don't work only with average performance, average... Um, average efficacy, average time. Take a look at the individual values of your experiments. Okay, going back, what would happen if we ignored the dependency between what we, what the observations? What would happen if we did not do pairing? So here we are doing the t-test of the two methods on the seven problems without pair, unpaired t-test. And what you can see here is that our t statistic is minus 0 0.3. This is way in the middle. Our p-value here is 0 0.7. It's right in the middle of the new hypothesis. So if we do the unpaired t-test on a paired experiment, we will not, the t-test will say, no, new hypothesis is fine, nothing to reject here. Why? This happens because the difference between the problems is bigger than the difference between the methods. So the difference between the problems hide the difference between the methods. 
So here we have a visualization, okay? Here's the data of the experiment. The red data is method A, the blue data is method B. And as you can see, the difference between the methods is much smaller than the difference between the problems. When we look here, it's very clear why we cannot reject the new hypothesis in the unpaired test. This is because if we don't consider the problem, the two methods have about the same, the same performance. Okay, so this is why pairing is important. On the other hand, you also should not use pairing when your experiment is not paired. If there is no pairing here and you do pairing, you're going to reject a new hypothesis when you should not. Why? Because you could select the exact pairing that will remove all of the difference that, uh, that will create an artificial difference between your pairs. So don't use pairing if your experiment is not paired. But if your experiment is paired, don't forget to use pairing. Okay? All right. This is the end for video number two. Sorry for the video that's a little bit longer than normal. I hope that you enjoyed it. And in the next video, we're going to look at comments, talk about the report, etc. See you there.